The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. A Challenger Lifetime Annuity can do more for portfolio outcomes. A combination of income streams, blending a Challenger Lifetime Annuity with other sources of retirement income, such as an account-based pension, means your clients can get the best of both worlds, guaranteed regular income for life, and access to capital as needed. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for joining me again. I'm going to apologize at the outset. I have a little bit of a cough, so if we don't edit out some of the coughs as you're listening back. Uh, my apologies, but I have the pleasure of speaking with Abby Gatling today. Uh, Chris from Chris Commu- Crisp Communications, a bit of a tongue twister for me, Crisp Communications. Thank you for, for joining me today. We're going to talk about financial advisor marketing, I guess, but we'll, I don't know, we'll see where the conversation goes. Yeah, see where it goes. Thanks so much for having me, James. And uh, and and as I said before, we pressed record at somewhat short notice. Thank you for, for joining me. We early coordinated this one yesterday, and here we are today recording, and it'll probably be out on Thursday morning. So, uh, Crisp, I can see in, the, in your background there, you've got the hashtag stay crisp, uh, crispy on your, in your background there. Uh, tell us about crisp, crisp Communications. What's the business all about? Yeah, yeah. It is a bit of a mouthful. Crisp comms, we can shorten it to yeah. just to save your poor throat today. Um, but yeah, basically we are a digital marketing agency that works with financial advisors, advice businesses. And uh, yeah, my goal for this um, for my business is basically take the marketing stress off advisors and business owners. And so basically for most of our clients, we come in and we become part of the team and we look after every single part of their marketing. And what that practically looks like is that, you know, we can create a new brand for your business. We can build a high performing website for you write your content, email marketing, graphic design, basically a one-stop shop. Uh, we're kind of like your in-house marketing team, but you don't have to give us a desk. <laughs> and how did you end up doing this? Like, were, you, were you in a marketing role before you started your own business? Or you, how did you end up here? Yeah, so I've had a bit, bit of a an interesting career that's kind of taken a few twists and turns. Mm. But, you know, I've always been a really creative person, but I found myself in this path, this <laughs> career path, where I had a very serious, very business-oriented role, managing big teams and big budgets. And I kind of got to a point where I was like, oh, gosh, something is missing right now. And after some deep soul-searching, I realized it was creativity. Mm-hmm. So what I, what I did was I tried to squeeze as much creativity into my regular role. So I was working for the government. I worked for uh, not-for-profits and things like that. And I was just trying to pack as much creativity in as I could into these roles. And when I couldn't do it anymore, I looked for outside of that to see what I could do. And I started freelancing and I did some graphic design and some social media. And after a year or so, I realized I was actually enjoying the things outside of my nine to five more than I was actually enjoying my career. So you, you were doing that at the same time as your, as your regular job? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a mad, a mad person, and yeah. you know, I stay nine to five, but no one's job is ever nine to five. I was still working crazy hours, yeah. But I needed to get my fill somehow, so I took an internship and I managed someone's um, social media, and then I did this and I did that, and basically, it just got to this point where I was kind of going, "Why am I doing this on the side? This could be my real job." Um, and so I sort of just got to the point where I was like, "No, it's now or never." And I quit my job and I started my business. And then all these people came out of the woodwork that basically replaced my income within a couple of months. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's incredible. 
It was good because it's, uh, you know, I was working with people outside of my regular job and then they were telling people when they were happy and they were telling people when they were happy. So basically it just became this word of mouth referral business and it just kind of grew from there and it's been awesome. Yeah, and that's that, that's kind of the, the holy grail that a lot of financial advisors aspire to, this uh, this idea of do a good job with one person and then they'll refer the next and they'll refer the next. You tend to find, at least in my experience anyway, you kind of get this this core group of referrers and then everyone else tends to not refer, but uh, that, that's been my experience. So let's talk about your experience with working with financial advisors. What, what are financial advisors, and this might be a, a, a big one for your answer, but what are financial advisors still doing wrong in their marketing or, or what are they just not doing? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience with working financial mm-hmm. advisors because, you know, when I started the business, as I said before, it's like my pursuit of creativity and trying to do that. But luckily enough, some of my first couple of clients were financial advisors. And as we were talked about, they referred on. And so I started working for, for other firms, ASSLs, and kind of just going on like that. <laughs> and I think what naturally made me enjoy that type of work is because I really, um, I've got a bit of a skill set of being able to take things that are complex or kind of difficult or technical and translate them well to be something that people can engage with and understand and actually enjoy to consume, right? (laughs) So that sort of leads me into what I think that a lot of financial advisors do struggle with is that they're so talented and they're so technical. They've got this amazing skill set and knowledge base. But actually translating that through to the other end, to their clients who don't have that extensive background, that's kind of where they fall short. So that's where we can come in and we kind of be that translation piece between them. Yep. Yep. And, and so where does that, where would that, like if I was a, I'm running a financial planning business, I'm saying I'm, it's about with my marketing and my communications and so forth. Like where, where's the starting point for you for most new clients that you would engage with? Yeah, that's true. Like you can't just jump straight into, you know, <laughs> like running your social media or anything like that. You've actually yeah. got to look at the foundations of your marketing Yep. And so whenever I get uh, a new client in or talking to someone who wants to come on as, as a client, I'm always talking to them about, okay, like what are your goals in your business? Um, who's your target audience? What niche do you work within? And what's your key messaging around that about like the value that you can provide to those types of clients? Mm-hmm. Um because I think a lot of people think that their marketing strategy sits over here to the side and their business strategy sits over on the other side and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually your marketing strategy has to support your business goals. Yep. And so if you're not clear on your business goals and you know all that side of thing, then your marketing is just not going to be as effective as it can be. Yep. I, re- I was reading on your website before, I know you had, I'm going to get it wrong, but you had, you had had there was something on there about this idea of you kind of get busy being busy doing the work and then the marketing part falls to the side. Um, but it's kind of the marketing that's driven the work that's coming in in the first place, whether it's word of mouth or something. I think we can all appreciate that even if it is just a word of mouth referral, chances are that person's probably going to check out your website. They're going to look at your LinkedIn. They're going to try and find you and find out something about you. And so these, these marketing activities are integral to you being busy in the first place. But if you let something slip because you're too busy doing the work, well, then the marketing's going to stop and then you end up not having the work to continue on with. Yeah. There was something I like know. that and I read it. I'm like, that's a brilliant way to put it. It wasn't that many oh. words. Yes. <laughs> it might have been a bit more crisp than that. Yeah. But, <laughs> but that's true. I feel like I feel like when people are busy, they think, oh, we don't need the marketing because we've already got clients coming in. But if you don't have clients coming in, then you're not going to be busy. And so it's kind of this chicken or the egg situation. And I'm so glad that you said that, yeah, people do check you out online, even if they get a referral. Even if it's the hottest referral ever, they're still going to stalk you a little bit and they're going to find out as much information as they can about you before they actually talk to you. And so it's really... Uh, you know, after we kind of talk about what are your marketing goals and your business goals, the next thing I do is I do this kind of audit of 
what is your digital footprint look like? What does it look like currently? What is your digital presence? Sometimes there's nothing. <laughs> That's fine. Sometimes there's a really old set of things and, you know, it could be um, like an old photo of you. You've got a beard back in the day. Now you don't or or use you from 20 years ago. Or it could be that, you know, your your business has evolved since then and if they're going and they're looking at your old website or your old socials or old something like that, that may not be relevant to what you do now. And people may be self-excluding themselves from the conversation with you because they feel like they're not the right fit for you. So it, it's so important to know like what is out there and making sure that you are taking control of everything that is out there about you and, and your business. Yeah. So you do this audit and you kind of say you, you either have nothing or you've got lots or there's some gaps or something. <clears throat> How do you then move on to filling those gaps and and then and, and fixing that all up for people. Can you talk through what what's involved there? Yeah, yeah. So I mean it really just depends on what's out there. Some people are fantastic content producers and they're and they're putting lots of things out there and they're just not leveraging it well enough. So mm. we might have a process of kind of reining all that in and making sure that it's captured fully on your website or or you know other places. Uh, other times, it's literally a matter of doing a bit of a cleanup of Googling yourself mm-hmm. so you can do this yourself at home. Google yourself and see what comes up in the web, the web results, the pictures, the videos, and just see what is out there and then trace it back to where it's come from. So if you know it's out of date, incorrect, um, maybe doesn't look good for you, something is weird out there, the, like a negative review or something else that's a little bit strange Mm. then you can take active steps to go and take that down rectify it replace it with new content i was going to ask you like you know the the google yourself thing i think a lot of people probably maybe feel awkward about googling their own name but then clicking through and say well like what do you i was going to say what do you do about it if there's something that comes up that like if there's a, a poor review or something like that that might be a little bit more difficult but yeah how do you if there's some really old photo of you that comes up or like you know, get that that ranking page. The things that rank for you towards the top might not be the ones that you want to rank towards the top. Like how do you how do you fix that? What do you what do you do? <laughs> well, there are some things that you can control. So it could mm. be you know it could be this hidden page on your website that you've forgotten to take down. Yeah. Or it could be a listing in a business directory that is out of date, and you can go and try and reclaim that. Or it could be you know, someone else has written an article about you and it's just no longer relevant. So it's it kind of depends on where it is. Yeah. But um, things like negative reviews, um, I think they are not always a bad thing to have, obviously not a fantastic thing to have, but it is a really great way to go and um, take control of that and respond to it in a positive way. So that if people are finding those negative reviews, firstly, you're not being shocked about it. If someone calls you up and says, hey, I want to work with you, but there's this one-star review, tell me about it. Um, (laughs) You want to know exactly what it is and you want to know how to respond to that. Um, And that could be the case of actually just responding to the person itself, like if it's a Google review. Well, having a prepared response when people ask you about it. So there's a couple different ways of doing it that way. But then the next thing would be, okay, we can't get rid of everything. Sometimes things are just out of your control. It's a third-party website that's linking to you or you have completely locked yourself out of some type of account and you can't re- get rid of it. <laughs> like it happens to everyone. But what you can do is create new, fresh content that's more relevant, that's more interesting, that's more engaging and start putting that out there so then this old, stale content will be pushed lower and lower and lower on the internet. And everyone knows once you're on page two or three, no one ever sees it again. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah. And so how important in that is is having a like a current fresh website. Like I I every now and then I assume a lot of others do, you'll end up oh, you'll hear about some business name or something and you end up on some some website that looks like it was made fifteen years ago. They were doing some blogs there, but they stopped doing those five years ago. And the whole thing just doesn't look like it's been touched. The business is still around, but it just doesn't look like it's been touched. Like how is having that type of website even helpful at all? Is it doing you more harm than good? Like can can you talk about having an old style website? Yeah, look, I don't believe you should ever have bad design out there mm-hmm. <laughs> if it's old style and bad. But 
I also feel as though uh, if you're not going to maintain it, you really need to think about the type of website that you have because not every website needs to look like it's being updated all the time. You can make a really nice evergreen website that acts as sort of a brochure for your business, as in people go there, they can find out a little bit of information about you, but they're not going to interact with it in any way. That's fine if you want people to Google Google you and be able to find you, but it's not going to actually do much for actually growing your business. Yeah. Um, and especially if it is on there and it's old and there are old blogs and there's old staff members on there who don't work anymore and, and just the content is incorrect, it's actually better to take that down and have a more of a static site if you if you know you can't commit to maintaining it. Yeah, it's like you read this, it's trying to not maybe – try not have something that kind of date stamps it as it's being in a particular age. Like I, um, people ask me how long have you been in financial advice and certain things. I, 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 hate, I hate reading about so-and-so has worked in financial advice for 10 years or so-and-so has worked in financial advice for 15 years because eventually that 15 becomes 16, becomes 17, becomes 18 and, and, and just kind of date stamping it with a particular number of years, it becomes old eventually. And so maybe if you aren't going to update your website, perhaps it's just you just don't even do the whole blog thing in the first place because that's going to have a bit of a date stamp or you're going to be writing about some type of current event and unless you're going to be updating it, maybe just don't do it at all. Yeah. I do feel as though if you come across someone's website and they and it is old like that where you know they haven't touched it for years, it's all about the optics of that, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you're going, oh, okay, they haven't bothered to maintain their website, what does that say about their standards or mm-hmm. their attention to detail? Or, uh, you know, it, it just makes these questions swirl around in people's heads and that's not necessarily a good thing. So, yeah, you, you can be smart about not saying, I've been in the industry for 10 years. You go, oh, I've been in the industry since 2014. Yeah. And then <laughs> there you go. Straight away, it's an evergreen piece of content without uh, saying, I haven't actually looked at my website for two years. That's <laughs> <laughs> In, in financial planning world, is there something that you find stands out more often than not as something that needs fixing or is it just one person's completely different to the next? Oh, look, I'd say there's probably three key things that I see most of the time when I yeah. come across a, a brand new client. One is that what, they're not telling their story well enough. They are doing great, great things within their business, but from the outside, you just can't tell that. And their online presence don't <laughs> doesn't give that indication. The second thing is that people are just trying to do so many things, they get overwhelmed, and so they don't know where to start, and so they do nothing. Yep. <laughs> so that's when your website sits, you know, flat for so long. And then the third thing is that people have all these great ideas, but they just don't have enough time to implement. So they might start something and it looks really great, and you can just tell they've rushed it, they've let it go, and now it's been like three months and they haven't bothered, haven't bothered continuing that. So uh, so for me, I'm always trying to look at like which one of those three issues is at play here because they have very different solutions. Yeah. You know, like if there's the, if it's the too many options, they don't know where to start, that's fantastic because they've got lots of ideas and they're mm-hmm. keen to help with their marketing. They just need a bit of a strategy. Um, if they're not telling their story, they're doing great, great things out, um, outside of that, that's fantastic because that means you've got so much content just really at your fingertips. You just need to harness it. So trying to identify what those key issues are when you first start really can help you create a roadmap for the rest of your marketing. Yep, yep. And and so there's helping build the websites. Can you talk through what's involved there? Yeah, so I, I one of my pet peeves about websites is that depending to who, who you go with, they will try and sell you the type of website that they build. And it's like the one that they are, you know, proficient in making yeah, okay. and you can come across websites uh, for businesses and a lot of the time when people come to me and they're like I don't know how to log into my website or I don't know how to update my website or I wish it could do this thing but it doesn't and I'm like oh gosh so whoever's built this site for you in the first place has actually not taken the time to get to know you hmm. and your business and what you want to use it for and then building a site around that Because, um, you know, I love WordPress. I think it's one of the best things to build your website on. However, you do have to be pretty technical to maintain it. So I was Mm. thinking, well, James, you have someone in your team who can maintain this for you? No. Okay. Well, are you happy for us to maintain it for you? No. Okay. Then maybe 
maybe WordPress isn't the way to go. Let's think about a Wix site instead. So you can do that yourself because uh, it's just, it's terrible <laughs> when people have a website that they actually can't use and it doesn't fit their purpose. Yeah. So that's kind of the first step for me is kind of going, what, what are you using it for? What's your technical ability? And how do you want to look after it in the long term? And then we can kind of go from there with building the rest of their site. Uh, I said before about one of the issues is that uh, people aren't very good at telling their story. Yeah. Um, and so that's the good thing about me being an external person to your business is that I can ask you all these questions and drill down on these things and go, oh, that didn't quite make sense to me. Tell me about that. And I can kind of tease that story out of you. So then we can articulate it really nicely on your website. Um, and so that's our next step of the process is to kind of work on what are the key messages and the storytelling that needs to go on your site. Yep. And it's you, that that bit being the external person, it's like you can, if, if it's someone internal that's trying to do the website or whatever, they're, they're in it, there's potentially this assumption that you kind of know what we do, you know who we do work with and you know how it all works. Can't you just sort it out yourself? And that can be difficult. Like if if I was trying to build a website for our business, I mean, that would be really hard to do, even though I've worked there for years and you kind of know what's going on. It'd be far easier, I would think, being the external person, asking those questions, drilling down, as you said, and then obviously you can go and do it. Um, your website then talks about kind of email marketing and, and, and copywriting and, and, and so forth. Can you can you give us some tips on on what should we be writing about? How should we be writing like, what can we be doing in terms of communicating with our clients? Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, communication is my thing. Crisp communication, <laughs> as you know. Um, and I, I, I like to call myself a communication designer because, right. <laughs> because uh, it is really about being able to articulate those key messages and translate it for your clients. Because yeah. um, I think a lot of the time, we, yeah, we just get too in our heads and we get too focused on the detail. And we can't articulate ourselves clearly. So I guess the first part of when you're doing the communication, whether it's on your website, in your email marketing, in your socials or whatever, you really have to think about making it really clean, really crisp <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and don't make it too complex. I, I think I read somewhere that you, we should be writing for accessibility. We should be writing for an age 12 reader. Yeah, I, I read that some at some point too, yeah. Yeah, and that's not to say that you're talking down to anyone at all, but it's about saying, like, we do we have to add in this jargon? Do we have to add in this technical language? Is there another way that we can articulate it in a better way to maximise the um, opportunity for understanding? <laughs> and do you think do you think adding in, like, graphics and pictures and some, like, um, this, this kind of stock images you can put in there, like, do, do you think that's helpful or...? or- or not? Like, what's what's your take on that? Oh yes, definitely. So, yeah. um, you know, I originally trained as a teacher, and that was like my first sort of <laughs> foray uh, into my career. <laughs> yes, and so you know, from that, I realized that uh, we there are so many different types of learners out there. There's so many different ways of communicating. Not everyone is um, fantastic and comfortable at reading big blocks of text. It's hard for anyone, um, you know, at you know, the end of the day and you're reading it, it's, you, it's too hard, it's too boring. No one wants to push their way through it. So I often think that if you can replace massive blocks of text with, um, you know, a graphic, um, some type of an in- infographic, even just an icon to help, you know, tell the story a little bit better, absolutely do that. You don't want to go overboard, <laughs> but... Uh, but if you can shorten your sentences and use like supporting graphics, definitely. Um, you you mentioned stock footage before, uh, stock photos before. Yeah, I also have a love hate relationship with stock footage, stock <laughs> photos because uh, sometimes it's just so obvious, you know. And you, when you're communicating your business and who you are and how you can help people, you got to try and be as authentic as possible. Yeah. And and sometimes that's not having this fantastic perfect picture on your website sometimes just having a photo snapped on uh, your iphone or something like that can be just as good because it's showing a real situation it's showing a real person um and it gives people the opportunity to get to know you so 
not not saying that you shouldn't ever use stock photos. There are some good ones out there, but uh, just do a reverse image search before you do any use any stock photos, and you can see how many times that exact same it. photo yeah. is so the, used. The reason I like I, I I said that kind of phrase stock photos, like I was on your on your LinkedIn earlier, uh, and I was looking. I think you'd written something, and it just it just caught my eye. There was this photo. It was one of these stock image ones, and and you'd written something about it, and I hadn't read what you wrote, but it was it was just that this photo caught my eye. I'm like, oh, I've seen that photo before, and it was some classic, you know, family with kids or something sitting on the grass or whatever. I'm like, I've seen I've seen that before, and that just yeah. caught my eye, and then it made me kind of read your headline about about using stock images. So. You know, I'm I'm not review you know, reverse image search on Google, but but even even that particular picture, I must have seen it a million times before on other websites, and it's caught my eye, and yeah, uh, and then and then maybe pay attention to the headline that you've got there. Yeah, and how did that make you feel when you saw that same photo? Yeah, well, so once I once I like it made me stop once I saw it, but then when I read the headline, I'm like, yeah, you're like you're right. It kind of just doesn't feel authentic, does it? You kind of you you mentioned about different communication styles and and so forth. I've been and I love your input. I've been kind of swirling around this idea in my head that yes, we all communicate in different ways. People uh, want to learn in different ways and and so forth. And it's I, I think it would be easier as a, as a financial advisor to work with clients that understand in the same way that you communicate. Does that make sense? Like if I communicate in a certain way, that's easy for me to communicate in that certain way. It would be easy for me to work with clients that also then understand the way that I'm communicating rather than me have to communicate in this completely different way that doesn't feel natural to me to work with this other client over here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and so I had this thing swirling around in my head as I say, well, do we just you know you communicate in a particular way that you do your writing in in the example that that you're talking about? Does that then have a natural tendency to attract certain people that understand the way that you're communicating, but also repel others that 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 don't understand the way that you're communicating? Is that yeah? Am I communicating well to you? Does that make sense? <laughs> what I'm trying to get across is this thing that's been swirling around in my head for a while. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. I I think that. Um, some of the time it, it it can be easy for you to translate your communication style into a couple of different forms. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, I am handing over uh, an update on a website build. What I will do is I do sort of a dot point list of what we're at and what needs to come out. I, then I would do a loom recording of my screen as I do a walkthrough and I click around and I show people what I'm doing. And then I will yeah, do something else, like a third sort of option and I'll send it through. So that way, sometimes I can see they haven't even watched the video. So that's not their style. That's fine. They will read the email. So, and other times I can see they've read the, they've look, um, looked at the video, but they haven't responded to my question in the email. So, <laughs> so sometimes it is easy to translate into a couple of different forms, mm. but you can't go and completely change your style. Because I, I do think that the way you articulate yourself on your website and throughout all your comms is basically putting your head up saying, hey, this is who I am and this is how I choose to serve my clients. People will opt into that or they'll opt out of that. Yeah, yep. So like when I launched my business, I had a bunch of people sort of critiquing me for having such a pink website. So you see my website, it's very, very pink. And I've got my dog on there and it's really girly and I love it. And, you know, I was like, oh gosh, should I be changing that? Because people who don't really like pink, will they be turned off by my website and not choose to work with me? Sure, maybe. They may may have opted out, but my, my business is design, communication design, (laughs) <laughs> they don't like that style uh, and they don't like the way that I put things together, we're probably not going to be a good fit. So, yeah. It's, a good, it's good. It saves saves them wasting their time, saves you wasting your time for someone that's maybe not going to be a good fit. Yeah, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that I only design in the same style as what my website is. Yes. I've done some very, um, you know, dark and masculine style things. I did some design for um, someone who was a blacksmith a couple of years ago, and it was very emo style, completely the opposite to me. 
but that's fine because I can, I can, uh, I was able to translate what he was after yeah. to <laughs> to a design that's not necessarily what I would choose. But that's when you can know when you can actually translate your style, translate your communication, or whether it's just not for you, mm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested to talk about. You, you mentioned on your website about podcast management. Like, what? How are you working in that space? And 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 do you see podcasting as an opportunity for for financial advisors to market themselves in 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 one way, shape, or form? Can you talk about podcasting? Yeah, yeah. So definitely. So. I think that podcasting is just like a natural extension to your marketing strategy. Most people um, who are pretty active with their marketing are getting on camera, on the mic, exactly what we're doing now. And, uh, you know, you might be doing that for your social media. You might be recording videos for your website. I think that a podcast is the next natural step to that. It's quite a low barrier to entry. All you have to do is have a really good idea uh, commit to it <laughs> and um, and obviously your mic friend and everything like that. And I think that if you're comfortable doing that, it's a fantastic asset to uh, put into the arsenal of your marketing strategy. Yeah, yeah so I sort of got into it because uh, James, who's in my team, he's a fantastic media editor, uh, audio editor, video editor, and we just started doing it for a couple of clients who we were already doing some other work for. And they're like, hey, can you do this as well? Like, yes, yes, we can. Mm. <laughs> and so we picked it up like that because it's great once we get into the ecosystem of their business and we know everything that is going on in their business, it only makes sense that we kind of look after all these additional pieces as well. And then, yeah, we've actually started our own podcast last year. And that's just like another way of showcasing our, our skills in that area. But you don't actually have to start with your own podcast if you want to do podcasting as part of your strategy. Yeah. Um, guessing on other people's podcasts is a really good way of doing it, of building up your your name, your reputation, mm. your exposure. And um, you could just as easily do that without actually having your own podcast and having all the overheads that go along with that as well. Yeah. How would how do you get onto other people's podcasts? What would you do? <laughs> well, we do help our, our clients do this. Oh yeah. Uh, the, you know, I, you've got to really be clear on what you want to talk about, <laughs> firstly. So you might have a topic that you think is of particular interest. So I thought so you had Nathan Fradley on on this mm-hmm. podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. He's fantastic for it. So he, you know, he's got a very clear idea about what he wants to talk about, mm-hmm. ESG and those types of things. Um, so, you know, once you have a really clear idea of a topic, you might have two or three things that you would like to talk about, like different avenues to talk about within that topic. And then you basically need to go out and research and find who is actually having podcasts about these. Yeah. Um, and then just systematically approach them, ask to be on there, give examples of previous um, episodes that you've been on. It always helps to have like a one pager as well with your bio, your experience, your photos, those bits and pieces, because people want to know who they're talking to. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's about just kind of plugging away and, and yeah, working on yeah. it. <laughs> so what, if as a financial advice business trying to start my own podcast, who do you, like, do, do, do financial advice businesses do it, like, about themselves, kind of in interviewing or having conversations with, you know, like, team members amongst themselves, and I don't know, they're talking about, whatever, or or do they find guests, invite clients on? Like, how are financial advisors using podcasts? Can you talk about it a bit? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few different ways of doing it. So I know some AFSLs who are using it as an opportunity to showcase the advisors within their group. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of just like a little mini promo for them, I suppose, mm. and it's helping people get to know their advisor better. But I've also seen advisors run it themselves and they might um, do it as uh, positioning themselves as, uh, say, a thought leader in the industry. So it might be a solo podcast where they talk about current topics and trends and news and it's their opinions and interpretation of that. Um, But then we also have other advisors um, who – do interviews uh, with other people about things that relate to their business. Yep. So Joe Stefan, who was also on, on Ensemble here, mm. um, he has a great podcast. He works primarily with family businesses 
and he has um, interviews with people who are in family businesses and people who are pursuing some, you know, meaning rather than money. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he that's his topic. And so we find people who are doing cool things in the family business space who are pursuing this higher meaning. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there's a couple of different ways of doing it, but it's about what suits you and what suits your business. Yeah, it's a great idea, is there? Great ideas. The last thing I thought I wanted to talk about, I thought was a really great way of 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 dealing with kind of working with you and, and your business in one way, shape, or form. You've got on your website. There's like three different options to uh, to to kind of work with you. And I'll maybe get you to, to to touch on that. But it's this idea of you you kind of essentially just buy a pack of hours by the looks of things. And it's how how much how much work do you do you want? Can you talk about working with you and, and what's involved? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we do have three different ways of working with uh, with our advisors. The first way, like I said before, is when people kind of embed us within their team as their like in-house marketing team. Um, and that is sort of like a retainer style model, starts from two hours a week. And that's where we can basically take over every part of your day-to-day marketing. Yep. Um, so, we can write your email newsletters, we can maintain your website, we can write your blogs, all those sorts of bits and pieces. Um, the next way that we work with people is when you have sort of like a once-off project, so a whole website build or a rebrand, something that's like kind of big and substantial and there's a really clear beginning and end point. So that we sort of give people a custom quote for that and, you know, we might work with them after that, but it's very kind of defined and the last way, which you just mentioned, is our uh, crisp snack pack. Which yeah, yeah. Is, <laughs> that was a great idea. Yeah, yeah. you know, you got to stick with the branding, right? Consistency is key. And the crisp snack pack is actually just something I added in last year, but it's been super popular where you kind of fall in between that sort of project work and regular work. You might be only a small business with a couple of, uh, couple of people in your business, so you probably don't have huge marketing needs. Um, so this is where you can pre-purchase 10 hours of support and you just snack away as you please mm-hmm. and the hours don't expire. So that's been really popular, especially for some of our, you know, solo advisors who just need that extra little bit of support. Yeah. P- uh, I could see that as a good option for people that are just starting out. They need they need a bit of help until they're until they're up and running enough and they can afford to engage you, you know, properly in a in a in a in a more ongoing manner. But yeah, a few hours here and there would be really helpful, I reckon, for a lot of businesses as they're starting out. So, Abby, yeah. where can people find you if they want to know a little bit more about you, get in touch? Where's your, where, where's the best way to find you? Um, I reckon if you head to my website, it's crispcoms.co. Um, and actually on there I've got a whole bunch of resources for financial advisors. So, you know, if you're not quite ready to engage us, there's tons of information on there about Things you can take and do yourself with it, with your marketing. So information on your website and lead magnets and email marketing. So that's a pretty good place to start. And of course, if you have any other questions, you can just book in a time to chat with me. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks. We'll uh, we'll link your website in the in the show notes. I think they're called uh, on the, on the different streaming platforms wherever you might be listening. Thank you, Abby, for joining me. Thanks for having me.